This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Make or break. That's how some are describing the week ahead for investors as the Fed decision comes into focus and tech valuations are questioned. Targeting cancer, Pfizer makes a $10 billion deal to expand its cancer lineup and its footprint in an area known as precision medicine. High stakes. Airbus unveils a new jet and announces new orders at the Paris Air Show, while rival Boeing plays defense. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, June the 17th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Inflection point, crossroads, watershed moment, whatever you want to call it, it has arrived for the market. Investors are looking for clarity on two major issues, interest rates and trade. This week, the Federal Reserve policymakers meet to decide whether now is the time to lower the benchmark rate. Most say it is not but some say it is. The market wants a rate cut. Some economists argue it's not necessary. If a rate cut doesn't come at this week's meeting, investors will be looking for clues as to when it will, given the escalating geopolitical and trade tensions, as well as slowing global growth. And with that as a backdrop, investors were in wait and see mode today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 22 points to 26,112. The Nasdaq added 48, and the S&P 500 was up two. Bob Pisani starts us off tonight from the New York Stock Exchange. Stocks are off to a quiet start so far, but there's no shortage of market-moving catalysts to come in the week ahead. That's what's important. Trade talks in the Federal Reserve will be front and center all week with President Donald Trump set to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping next week at the G20 meeting in Japan. But earlier today, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross downplayed prospects of a major trade deal getting done. Very hard to put timetable on things. I think that we will eventually probably make a deal. But if we don't, the president is perfectly happy with continuing the tariff uh, movements that we've already announced, as well as imposing the new ones that he has temporarily suspended. We saw trade-related sectors like semiconductors, materials, industrials, all weaker today generally as a result of that. On the flip side, we did see some strength in communication services like Facebook, Netflix, and Google Parent Alphabet all turning around a bit. The other big issue for the week is the Federal Reserve. They kick off a two-day meeting on interest rates tomorrow. The question now is, can the Fed set the stage for a new easing cycle when it meets on Wednesday? Many traders are expecting Fed Chair Jay Powell to leave the door open for a rate cut later this summer, maybe even next month, without sounding the alarm about a global economic slowdown. It won't be easy to get the tone right on that. Right now, interest rate sensitive groups like utilities and real estate are essentially at historic highs as rate cuts make them more attractive investments for investors who have been starving for yield. Later in the week, by the way, we'll also get key data on housing and manufacturing, both of which will paint a clearer picture of just how healthy the economy really is. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. So there's a lot to come, a slew of economic data, the Fed, the ongoing trade talks. Will these be catalysts that move the market higher or will they be roadblocks that push it lower over the next couple of weeks? Joining us right now, Jack Ablin, founding partner and chief investment officer at Crested Capital. Jack, I cannot recall a wider spectrum of forecasts for a Federal Reserve meeting. You know, plenty of people are saying it's not going to happen this time around, but a few high profile people, economist Diane Swank, uh, Jim Grant, they're saying they could cut rates this week. What do you think is going on here? Well, you know, it's a matter of what they should do and what they, sh you know, what they should do and what they will do. And I think if, you know, if it's, it comes to either nourishing the economy or feeding a very hungry stock market, um, my, my sense is that, that they ultimately will cave to market pressure and lower rates. I don't think they want to do it this week. Remember, if we look at the economy right now, we're coming off one of the strongest quarters we've had in the last 10 years. Uh, the labor market's the best it's been in 10 years. Uh, confidence is running high. So, you know, from an economic, purely economic standpoint, there's actually very little justification for lowering rates. In fact, it's really just a sort of a consequence of this stalemate going on with trade that's right. causing problems. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where we're, uh, you know, we need to focus next. Which puts the focus directly on the G20 meeting, does it not? I mean, um, if we're 
going to get any progress with trade. The president and the uh, Chinese premier are reportedly going to meet. That could change, certainly. But might the Fed want to wait and see what the outcome of that meeting is? Yeah, I mean, if I were a member of the Federal Open Market Committee, I'd say absolutely. Let's take a wait and see. The fact is we have this, you know, potential for an agreement, albeit I would say it's remote, um, to perhaps wipe away these tariffs, move back to business as usual and, you know, carry on. Um, that said, uh, you know, most investors or most Americans believe this is a trade dispute. This really is really more uh, about the global uh, dominance in technology and life science. Uh, and the, the president is using trade as really one of his only weapons to get get the Beijing's attention. So the fact that there is such a gape, uh, gaping uh, uh, d difference right. in philosophies suggests to me that, you know, a sweeping trade uh, negotiations, a deal around the corner still seems pretty unlikely. Well, get the popcorn ready. It's going to be an interesting week, that's for <laughs> sure. Jack Ablin with Crescent Capital. Again, thanks for joining us, Jack. Thank you. Goldman Sachs is raising some questions about the sect tech sector today. The firm says the valuation for growth stocks is high, and if so, what could that mean for the overall market? Joining us to talk about that is Paul Meeks. He is the lead portfolio manager for the Wireless Fund. Welcome, Paul. Nice to have you here. Thanks, Sue. Uh, you know, Goldman Sachs made some pretty compelling uh, arguments, but you think they've taken it a little bit too far. You're not as bearish on that particular sector of the market. Why? Now, I'm value sensitive. I typically only buy stocks when they've really come down a lot and they're still uh, embracing my long-term themes. I think Goldman's call today was far too broad because when you take a look at the tech sector, it's actually made up of a number of component industries. And there are a couple of industries, such as semiconductors, that looked actually quite cheap to me because they're the ones that have been beaten up the most by the ban on Huawei and also the continuing trade and tariff uh, battles with China and the U.S. Well, that's, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. I mean, fundamentally, you may find some of these high-profile technology companies are cheap, but they face some very big political headwinds in Washington when we talk about the antitrust investigations that are going on that go after some of the big fang stocks right now, right? That's true. It'll be interesting to see what happens with uh, these ongoing investigations, the FTC and the Department of Justice, with at least four of the major tech companies and both of the major social media companies. But the way I look at this is particularly the FTC uh, investigation. This is something that's been going on for a long time. I don't think that that is new news. As it pertains to the Department of Justice, something uh, more new something more interesting, something that we have to be wary of. But I also think it's a lot of pressure uh, going into the presidential election uh, in the next couple of years, where all of uh, both sides of the aisle are interested in showing their strength versus these companies. I don't want to say it's much to do about nothing, but I do think once we get through with this, there won't be that many changes and uh, far less consequential than some people think right now. So given the broad swath that, that we've talked about here, where are you still finding compelling value in the tech sector? So, Sue, what I've done is I do think you need to play some defense in the near term, and so I have a little bit higher cash than usual, and I've been hiding in a couple of, I call them techish names, that are mm -hmm. more uh, secure and stable. And these are companies like the payment processors, uh, MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, even bought some uh, Disney recently with its video streaming entree and trying to stay away from some of the big cyclical companies, particularly those that are uh, tied up in the geopolitical mess. On that note, Paul, thank you so much. Paul Meeks thank you. with the Wireless Fund. We have deal news today. Pfizer bought Array Biopharma for more than $10 billion. The acquisition beefs up the drug maker's portfolio of cancer treatments just as it faces an increase in generic competition for some of its popular drugs. Shares of Array soared by 56% today. Pfizer gained a fraction as well. Meg Terrell has more for us tonight.
Pfizer is making a $10 billion bet in an area known as precision medicine. The idea that identifying the drivers of disease can lead to more effective treatments. Array Biopharma makes targeted cancer drugs, an approach that's garnered increasing attention from investors in biotechnology. We think that targeting the root cause of disease uh, is the best way to approach uh, drug development. Big pharmaceutical companies agree. Pfizer's acquisition of Array is just the latest focused on targeted therapies for cancer. Earlier this year, Eli Lilly purchased Loxo Oncology for $8 billion, and GlaxoSmithKline acquired Tesaro for $5 billion. In Array, Pfizer gets a pipeline of experimental medicines for different kinds of cancer, as well as a combination of drugs approved to treat a form of melanoma. That combination also has potential in other cancers, something Driehaus Capital Management's Mike Caldwell said drew his firm to the stock. What got us really excited was their data in colorectal cancer, um, which is a market that they will have a best-in-class profile as well because right now there are no competitors there and, and there's nobody that's on their heels. So that's a market that, um, that Pfizer will be able to own um, that's substantial uh, and where Array's data are really compelling. The deal also spurred speculation about more acquisitions of biotech companies, driving up shares of others developing targeted cancer drugs like Blueprint Medicines and Marathi Therapeutics. And while the precision medicine approach isn't a cure-all, Pfizer's investment in the space, according to Caldwell, is evidence of its promise. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. A number of disappointing economic reports to tell you about. A key gauge of manufacturing activity in the New York region saw a record decline in June and fell into negative territory for the first time in two years. Any reading below zero indicates a contraction in activity. The report suggests that business sentiment around tariffs is starting to sour, particularly because manufacturers tend to be extra sensitive not just to the actual implementation of tariffs, but also to the threat of new ones. Meanwhile, sentiment among the nation's home builders dipped in June. That industry is still plagued by some familiar concerns like the high cost of construction materials and a continued lack of skilled labor. Trade issues also don't help. Tariffs are adding to the cost of lumber, and that's been going up anyway. Latest survey also cited excessive regulation for the downturn in confidence. And those tariffs are one of the reasons why the nation's chief executives are feeling less optimistic about the economy. Dominic Chu breaks down the latest survey that measures CEOs' moods. Business leaders in America are losing confidence in the outlook for business in America. That's according to a new survey released by the chief executive group, which asks hundreds of CEOs across the country about their concerns and challenges. And the month of June saw CEO confidence fall to the lowest level since December of last year. 384 CEOs representing various sized businesses collectively feel less confident about future conditions. One of the biggest reasons for the drop in confidence has to do with heightened trade tensions between not just the U.S. and China, but also because of the recent issues surrounding trade relationships with Mexico. That drop in confidence is also showing up in what CEOs think will happen with their company financials in the coming year. While nearly three quarters of survey respondents felt like they would see an increase in sales and profits when May numbers were collected, this month those numbers dipped. The same themes bear out when it comes to how much they expect to spend on things like hiring and investing in buildings and production facilities, where only around half expect to hire more workers or spend more on capital expenditures. The good news is that much of the drop in optimism is due to the uncertainty around trade and tariffs. If those overhangs were to work towards eventual resolutions, CEO confidence may very well see a turnaround. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. We begin with shares of Disney. They were cut to inline from outperform at Imperial Capital. The analyst cited the stock's big run-up this year so far, saying that shares are now what he calls a at a record multiple. Price target $147. That stock fell a fraction today to $140.97. Dow Inc. was downgraded to market perform from outperform at BMO Capital Markets. The analyst uh, says that global trade issues and weaker growth worldwide will make 2019 a challenging year for this material science company. Price target, $52. Shares fell 3.5% today to 49.35. 
Deer was upgraded to outperform from neutral over at Baird. The analyst cites higher prices for some crops, which should help drive farms and equipment demand. The price target is $175. The stock rose more than 1.5% to 154.37. Keurig Dr. Pepper was upgraded to outperform from market perform at BMO Capital Markets. The analyst cites the potential for earnings growth. The price target is $34. Shares were up nearly 5% to $30.04. Still ahead, Boeing and Airbus go head to head. A grounded 737 MAX and a new airplane from Airbus. The two stories dominating this year's Paris Air Show. I'm Phil LeBeau in Paris. That story coming up on Nightly Business Reports. There are reports tonight suggesting that the FAA will soon begin certification flights to test the changes Boeing made to the 737 MAX flight control system. But Boeing says those flights have yet to be actually scheduled. Meanwhile, the future of the MAX has been in focus at this year's Paris Air Show, where aviation companies historically book some big orders. This year, that's exactly what Airbus did, but Boeing did not. Phil LeBeau is there. The roar of planes soaring above the Paris air show could not drown out the two big stories swirling on the tarmac, the changing fortunes of Airbus and Boeing, more specifically the 737 MAX and whether Boeing can get the grounded plane recertified and back in service by early September or whether it will be closer to the end of the year. Well, certainly we expect to have that happen before the end of the year, as we've said. I can't give you a specific timetable. That'll be governed by the regulators. We're keeping our airline customers very much in the loop so they know exactly what's going on. What many are unclear about is exactly how much the grounding of the MAX will hurt Boeing's business long term. And by extension, hundreds of companies building parts for the plane. The primary issue that everybody's focused on, whether it be the OEMs, not just Boeing, but also Airbus, because uh, it's an industry issue, and then it's, it's obviously hanging over every supplier and every discussion and every investment people are looking at. That's the biggest issue, certainly. The other big story in Paris is the new Airbus A321 XLR, a longer range, narrow body plane designed to connect smaller cities that are farther apart. Air Lease Corp, which leases hundreds of airplanes to airlines around the world, is buying the first batch of XLRs scheduled to start flying in 2023. There's huge demand there, and the great advantage of the 321 XLR to an airline is not having to fly a wide body uh, on some of these city pairs that really don't, don't demand it. The launch of the XLR, while questions swirl around the 737 MAX, means Airbus will easily rack up more orders than Boeing in Paris. But overall, there will be far fewer new airplanes ordered at this year's show, the fewest in three years, as airlines wait to see when the MAX will get back in the air. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Paris. Today, shares of Boeing rose more than 2 percent, but the stock is down 16 percent since the deadly Ethiopian airline crash in March. The 737 MAX was grounded worldwide shortly after. Going once, going twice, sold. Sotheby's hits the block. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus with Bid Air USA. That's a private group controlled by French media entrepreneur and art collector Patrick Drahi. He bought the auction house for more than three and a half billion dollars. If it's approved by shareholders, Sotheby's will return to private ownership after 31 years as a publicly traded company. And shares surged more than 58 percent today to 56.13. CNJ Energy and Keen Group have agreed to a merger of equals and a deal valued at nearly $2 billion. That merger will create a diversified oil field services company with more than $4 billion in annual revenue. CNJ Energy rose 20 percent to 1287, while Keen rose 7 percent to 748. And at that Paris air show, General Electric notched a $20 billion engine order from India's budget carrier Indigo. A company jointly owned by GE and Francis Safran, 
will make engines that power nearly 300 Airbus aircraft for Indigo. Shares of GE fell more than 1.5% to 10.05. Grubhub is teaming up with Duncan Brands to allow people to order online at 400 Duncan stores in New York City through Seamless, which is Grubhub's New York brand. After the Big Apple, that service will then expand to Boston, Chicago, and Philadelphia in the coming months. Grubhub climbed more than 2 percent to 72.01. Duncan rose a fraction to 80.50. The Chinese e-commerce company Alibaba is proposing an eight-for-one stock split, a move designed to increase flexibility in raising capital. Under the proposal, the number of ordinary shares would increase from $4 billion to $32 billion. A vote will be brought up at Alibaba's annual meeting next month. The shares were up more than 1 percent to 159.91. A Lockheed Martin executive says he is not concerned that the proposed merger of Raytheon and United Technologies would affect the F-35 program. Greg Ulmer, the program manager for the F-35 fighter jet, believes the merger will also not put pressure on the company's profit margins. The shares dropped a fraction to 348.69. A healthcare startup wants to shake up and simplify part of the very complicated healthcare system. And its mission sounds very similar to the one set forth by the joint venture between Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, and Amazon. Bertha Coombs has the story. Collective Health has administered health plans for tech neighbors like Activision, Pinterest, and Uber for the last five years. With a new $200 million investment led by tech venture firm SoftBank, the startup aims to build its business with midsize and large self-insured employers beyond Silicon Valley. Establish new local, regional, and national network partnerships, work with provider systems. And build out its technology infrastructure, which weaves together health benefits all on one platform, making it more efficient to navigate for employers and workers. Providing our members with much more intelligent, machine learning powered navigation capabilities, understanding what their health care needs, often before even they know what they need. Early investor Mohammed Makzumi says like employers, investors are looking for health technology firms that make benefits more cost efficient. Digital health has been the fastest growing subcategory in all of venture for the last seven years. You know, more money is flowing capital inflows into private digital health companies in 2019 than in 2018, 2017, 2016 combined. Arguably, one of the biggest investments in the last year has been Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan's formation of Haven, a new venture trying to use technology to reimagine employer health care. But analysts say SoftBank has a record of investing in tech unicorns valued at more than a billion dollars, which can dominate in their businesses. I think it was also fair to assume that it would take a long time to get there, and you know now is the time to to make an investment and to make a stake. Now put a stake in the ground. The six-year-old startup sees plenty of room for both. It's an encouraging sign that they're trying to do a lot of the same things that we have been doing. In fact, Collective Health would like to work with Haven and its founding firms. For them, the real competition is about disrupting the traditional insurers. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bertha Coombs. You probably have heard by now that Gloria Vanderbilt passed away today, and what a life she lived. Yes, she was the great-great-granddaughter of the fabled rail titan Cornelius Vanderbilt, and she was forever known as the poor little rich girl when her adult relatives waged a highly publicized custody battle over her in the 1930s. But she also made her own mark in business, most famously with her Gloria Vanderbilt jeans, which helped usher in the designer jeans craze of the 1970s. It was the beginning of a $100 million fashion empire. Beyond that, Vanderbilt published poetry, short stories, and novels. She wrote four memoirs, all of them bestsellers. Gloria Vanderbilt was 95 years old.
A group within the Treasury Department is recommending mandatory financial literacy courses for college students. The report also suggests that financial aid letters should itemize attendance costs. The group says such practices are especially important now because Americans have loaded up on $1.5 trillion in student loan debt. Here we go again. A number of companies will be making their Wall Street debuts this week, and one of them is a company called Slack. This company's software is used by businesses to help employees communicate. And just as it aims to shake up instant messaging, it's also going public in a non-traditional way through something called a direct listing as opposed to a more common IPO. Leslie Picker explains. A direct listing differs from the more traditional initial public offering in three major ways. One, no underwriters. In an IPO, underwriters will find investors, market the shares, and help set a price based on demand. Direct listings instead involve financial advisors, usually from the same Wall Street firms. These bankers provide advice about the process and help with the discovery of the opening price. Financial advisors cost less than underwriters. Spotify's direct listing cost about a third of what the company would have spent on an IPO, saving the company about $100 million. Two, no cash. Instead of raising money, the primary purpose of a direct listing is to create a public market for a stock by allowing early investors and employees to sell and newer investors to buy. Three, no roadshow. Traditional IPOs require executives to spend two weeks on the road visiting with investors to pitch the deal and drum up demand. But direct listings generally require just one day, really just a few hours, for executives to webcast the pitch for any investor who wants to tune in. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Leslie Picker. And before we go, here's a look at the final day's numbers on Wall Street. The Dow rose 22 points, the Nasdaq added 48, and the S&P 500 was up two. And that is Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.